So thank you very much, Paco. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I did my thesis at the Complutense, but I was never here at yeah, the Autonoma ever. <laughs> so it's the first time. <laughs> so I'll be talking about these two telescopes, Magic 1 and Magic 2, and the physics we've been doing with them in the last nine years. So just a quick start for very beginners. I mean, we are talking about this, you look at the spectrum, we are talking about this very high energy gamma rays. It's not only gamma rays there, it's, it's really very high energy gamma rays in excess of giga electron volts, okay? So we can say this is the last astronomical window because in the past we opened windows like infrared, radio, ultraviolet, and this is the last one that has been open for astronomy, okay? Uh, first question you may want to ask is, how can you detect gamma rays if the atmosphere is totally opaque to gamma rays? So, well, obvious solution is you go up to space, okay? So you uh, launch your detector in a rocket, or you use a balloon, or even you can observe from the rocket like it was at the very beginning, uh, or you put your telescope here in a, in a satellite, okay? So there have been several of these guys, SAS2, Cosby, Egret. Egret was the last one until these two brand new detectors that are running right now. One is the Agile, Italian Agile detector. The other one is a, a mainly American, but also French, Italian, Fermi, LAT uh, detector. Okay. I will be talking quickly about this. Uh, just to mention that, well, this is a rather conventional uh, concept. You detect gamma rays because they produce pairs of electrons and po uh, uh, of an electron and a positron, and you have a tracker to follow the direction of the electron and the positron. So that means the direction of the gamma, and then you have a calorimeter down there to to get a handle of the energy. Okay, so it's just very basic. The problem with these guys, these these detectors, is that uh, well, it's very expensive to 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 put something in space. So you are limited in, in, in size, you are limited in weight. And, and that means that the collection area, typical collection area, or the one that has been, uh, has been deployed for, for Fermi is only one square meter, roughly, okay. And what is more, uh, the calorimeter has only 10 <coughs> radiation lengths, and that means that you are limited in energy too, because when you go to high energies, the, the, the cascades that you develop here, they, they cannot be contained, so you cannot estimate the energy, okay? <coughs> so what to do then? Uh, well, the, the solution is to actually use the whole atmosphere of the Earth as a detector, okay? And that's what we do in ground-based gamma ray astronomy. So what you do is you expect uh, gamma rays are, a, the atmosphere is opaque to gamma rays because gamma rays interact with Nuclei in the atmosphere, they produce pairs, and pairs uh, produce, well, the, the electrons and positrons, they produce via uh, brain strong, they produce gammas, and at the end you have a cascade, electromagnetic <coughs> cascade, right? So these uh, charged particles are ultra-relativistic, and they produce chunk of light. Okay, so what you do is you have a telescope down here that can detect this chunk of light, and that's why they are called chunk of telescopes, right? And they, uh, well, you will see why they are called imaging in a minute. Just to mention that the energies where these happen and where we can start to detect uh, gamma rays using this technique are roughly 30 GV. And this is conventionally called very high energy, okay? So again, this is the particle shower and you produce chunk of light, you collect the chunk of light with an optical reflector and you see the, the shower as a kind of an image with an elliptical shape this is how your gamma looks like in this camera. And the size of this detector is actually not the detector itself, but the area where you have light, okay? So it's huge. It has a, a radius of 120 meters. That means 10 to the four, at least 10 to the four meters uh, detection area compared with one square meter from space. You can do even better. You use several telescopes and that's what you do in an array of imaging atmospheric chunk of telescopes because you can combine the information from the images produced in the different telescopes, okay? 
So you get a handle of the direction of the, of the gamma ray, and you get a handle of the uh, energy, and you get a handle of the nature of the particle because you have a huge background of cosmic rays, okay? So now going right away into magic. Magic, these two telescopes uh, are operated by this magic collaboration, which is a collaboration of several countries. Spain, Germany, and Italy are the major partners. Is in La Palma in Spain, in the Canary Islands. There are actually seven Spanish groups. Uh, one is, for instance, uh, Astrophysical de Andalucía, where Paco is actually the group leader of this, this group. IEC in the Canary Islands, I come from IFI. ICE, UAB, and UB are all in Barcelona too. UCM, you know, is the Complutense. And recently, uh, CIEMAT actually joined. So this was a first tele uh, single telescope, one telescope only. It was the largest, largest ever constructed. It had a, or it has a diameter of 17 meters. Okay, this is like 17 meters, and that means that it can go to the lowest possible energies for gamma rays. Okay, so it can go down as, as low as 50 GeV. Okay, which is a big achievement for these kind of telescopes. Uh, it's actually quite uh, advanced technologically because it's, it's pretty light. All this structure is like 50 tons, and it's a huge mirror. Okay. Now, uh, second telescope joined observations in 2009. It's essentially a clone of the first one. And now we operate in stereo, and you saw before what the benefit of stereo is. You can use the information from the two telescopes. Okay. So just a couple of numbers about performance. So energy threshold is 50 GeV. And it's the lowest among these kind of telescopes. And it actually overlaps with this other space-based detector I mentioned before, Fermi. Okay. Sensitivities typically are down here, this curve here, which is around 1% of CRAP. Okay. CRAP is the reference source of these energies. Okay. You want to know in centimeters squares, 10 to the minus 12 are around 200 GeV. Angular resolutions for the standard of astronomy are poor, something like 0.1 degrees, six are minutes at these energies, down to half of it at uh, high, ha, high energies. Energy resolution is, is also by the standards, at least of optical astronomy, is rather poor too, 20, 15%. But that's how we have to live uh, at these energies. So now, yeah, moving in the, into the physics, which Fifty hours. So now moving into the physics, uh, after nine years or eight and a half or so, first thing I have to say is that uh, it's like most of the astronomical instruments. So it has many problems. It, it, it tries. To, it tries to solve many problems. It's not like a typical experiment in particle physics or in energy physics where you mainly head in at trying to target some particular physics question. So there, there's a broad, uh, there's a diversity of physics here. And it, it actually, it has too many results for a seminar, I would say. <laughs> That's the, the, that's the name of the game in this kind of astronomy. And since this talk is about physics, I will not be talking about that. But <laughs> a cosmic, this is a gamma ray sh shower image. A cosmic ray looks different. Okay? It produces an image that is normally more blurred. Okay? And in general, they are isotropic, so they point somewhere else. Okay? So the name of the game in getting these sensitivities eliminating this background of cosmic rays. Okay. But uh, I'm not going to talk about this here, but this is a topic for a whole seminar. Okay. We have spent pretty much of our time working on that. There's an irreducible background of cosmic electrons. As you can imagine, they are so similar to gammas that uh, they're slightly different, but so similar. So then I, I selected in a kind of arbitrary way, <laughs> two topics, okay? One is cosmic rays, 
from our galaxy to the scale of clusters of galaxies. And the other one is AGNs, active galactic nuclei, but not as themselves, but as probes of things like the measuring the extragalactic extra background light, cosmological parameters, or the extragalactic magnetic field. Okay? So first, let me discuss a bit about cosmic rays. I mean, cosmic rays is, are simply ultra relativistic particles. Right. So it's the, the sources I'm talking about are, are actually the largest hadron colliders out there. Okay. Galactic cosmic rays is a quick summary in a nutshell. They are protons, nuclei of essentially all elements present in the universe, electrons and positrons, with energies typically of more than one giga electron volt. So we are dealing here with simply with relativistic particles, very high energy particles. They do not follow thermal distributions, okay? So they are not in distributions of thermal equilibrium. They do not follow Boltzmann distributions. That's what they are called non-thermal populations. They typically, their spectra typically follow power laws, okay? They represent a significant fraction of the energy content of our galaxy. I mean, here I, I try to I put all these numbers together. Energy density in electron volt per cubic centimeter cosmic rays would be like one electron volt with big errors. If you look at the density in magnetic fields, it's more or less the same. Density in starlight is down here, 0.3 or so, and CMB is 0.25 electron volt per cubic centimeter. Okay, so they cannot be neglected. I mean, they, they also seem to be in equipartition with with these guys, right? I mean, they have similar energy density. So it looks like there must be some kind of mechanism which is transferring energy among these, these different observables. Okay. So just to mention that we discovered them 101 years ago now, and still we don't know where the sources are of these guys. So one of the physics goals of these kind of instruments is actually to find the sources of cosmic rays. We the main suspects uh, are supernova remnants, shell-type supernova remnants. And you get your supernova here, explodes, and in a time of thousands of years, you generate this shock as it expands into the interstellar medium. And in this shock, you can accelerate particles to relativistic energies. And these, these are the cosmic rays, and they diffuse into the galaxy and essentially fill up the whole galaxy. Okay, so how do we detect cosmic rays with these kind of telescopes where, as we were saying before, we detect cosmic rays, but they are not interesting because cosmic, cosmic rays get deflected in magnetic fields in the galaxy. We are more interested in the gamma rays produced by uh, cosmic rays. And protons can interact with interstellar matter to produce pi zeros, etc., and the pi zeros can produce gammas. Okay. So we detect them through pi zero decay. Okay. So since the density of cosmic rays is higher around the, these putative sources, one expects these nearby to shine in gamma rays. Okay. So we detect gamma rays coming from near supernova remnants. It's, like, it's a smoking gun for the acceleration of cosmic rays. Okay. Technical problem is actually that there are many cosmic ray electrons around here, and we are not so interested in these electrons. And these electrons produce in, uh, gamma rays too through inverse Compton scattering. Okay, so we have to get rid of this uh, inverse Compton. We have to try. We must try to find sources which produce only pi zero gamma rays. Okay. So actually, uh, the first generation of telescopes that was the time when uh, Paco was talking about before uh, we were in La Palma a long time ago. And the, the, also, the, the main goal of these guys was to detect tens to hundreds of supernova remnants through gamma rays. And they only detected one, OK? All these generation of telescopes. There were like three big telescopes working there, and they only detected one. So the second generation, which is the one that is operating now, MAGIC and, uh, and two more experiments, have detected a few of them. MAGIC has detected actually only three, OK? Why? It's a very simplistic uh, 
way to understand the flux of gamma rays is uh, you make your numbers is essentially what you get is you expect fluxes around 9 times 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 10 uh, per square centimeter and second at energies of 1 TeV. For typical supernova energies of 10 to the 51, typical distances of 1 kiloparsec, and typical densities of the interstellar medium like 1 atom per, per cubic centimeter. Okay? So if you look at, if you take this formula and you assume all these uh, reference values like 1 cubic centimeter, 10 to the 51, and all that, you should have detected many of these gas. Well, we looked there and we didn't see anyone. Well, we saw one. Okay. So the main problem I would say is, because still not quite clear, but the main problem I would say is that, uh, well, sun supernova arrangements are farther away, many of them, okay? But that we knew. Um, and the number density is not quite there. I mean, uh, when you look at the surroundings of supernova remnants, it's not that everywhere you find is one atom per cubic centimeter, okay? It's quite usual to have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that, okay? And this goes, uh, well, this goes directly into the flux, and this was reducing this, uh, the <coughs> our probabilities to, to detect the, the remnants by a square because the sensitivity was, was not there. Okay, so uh, these old guys, Chenko telescopes didn't have enough sensitivity. Actually, what we are detecting these days is not so much supernova remnants interacting with the interstellar medium with one uh, atom per cubic centimeter or less. It's very much supernova remnants interacting with molecular clouds. So around supernova remnants, you have molecular clouds, and sometimes you run into these molecular clouds. Or the cosmic rays are just diffused into these molecular clouds, and they have big masses, 10 to a 2, 10 to a 4, even, even more than that. And this is a, a massive target for, for, for production of gamma rays, okay? Um, so this is what you actually see here, what I'm trying to show here. This is something we did with magic. So in radio, you see this supernova remnant, okay? Called IC443. And in this region, there are clouds with around 10 to a 4 solar masses, okay? So when we look at, this is the same green shape, green circle here and here. And this is what you see with magic. With the poor angular resolution of magic, you essentially see only one bright spot, which does not cover the whole remnant. It only covers a small part of the remnant, okay? This is the whole remnant, as you see here. This is only a bright spot in the remnant. And this just happens to be because we can look at maps of molecular density, and these are the, this is the maximum of the molecular gas density, it just happens to be on top of the place where you have more density, where you have a cloud that is very dense, something like 10 to the 4 solar masses, okay? And that's the only region that shines in gamma rays, okay? So that's actually like a smoking gun because that means that it cannot be electrons producing inverse Compton. It has to be hadronic interactions of the cosmic rays with the cloud producing gamma rays, okay? This we have seen already in several supernova remnants. So there's always gamma ray emission where you have clouds, where you have target material, okay? And it has very much the cosmic ray density that we expected, okay? So this it looks more and more like uh, we are almost there. So you were reading the news last week, I think. There was very much fuss about discovering the sources of gamma of cosmic rays coming from the Americans of the Fermi satellite because they, they look at this same supernova remnant and what they saw is a spectrum actually that looks very much like what you expect from a hadronic source of cosmic rays. And that's because there's a minimum energy of these uh, gamma rays and it is due to the fact that you cannot produce less energy than half of the mass of the pion, okay? So there must be a cutoff down here, 60 GeV. And this affects the whole spectrum and produces this very characteristic pion bump, okay? So these guys look at IC443. This is, these are the magic points, but they look at lower energies, around 1 GeV, and they saw this spectral shape showing this pion bump. So this also points to the... Okay. 
half of it, uh, roughly. <laughs> okay. uh, Hundred uh, seventy is, is more like seventy something. <laughs> Oh, you say oh no, no, oh, it's, it's MEV, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so it's totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's total boosting, yeah, okay. factor okay. 10 to the 3. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so just moving a bit into the future, um, uh, in order to map the density of cosmic rays in our galaxy, I mean, to actually map, because we, were looking, we are looking at a few sources here and there where we can see that there's an interaction. It looks like there's hadronic production and so on. You really have to look at many supernova remnants, detect all of them, I mean, all around the galaxy, um, possibly at clouds around the supernova remnants. So you really have to have a detector that is at least 10 times more sensitive. And that's something I will show at the end of my talk. It's, it's called CTA. Okay, just to give you an idea, this is a very simplified view of the sky with this kind of, of, of detector. And what you really see are these big supernova remnants sometimes interacting with with molecular clouds around. I mean, this is a very much a science fiction <laughs> look of the sky with this new detector that is more sensitive. Okay. Okay, so, but there's not only galactic cosmic rays. I was talking about galactic cosmic rays. You go out there, out, out of the galaxy. Uh, normal galaxies like Andromeda, uh, they, should be, they should also have their density of cosmic rays that may be different because sometimes you have more supernova remnant, uh, supernova remnant rate, rate of supernovas that is uh, higher. Uh, typically, these guys are not luminous enough because they are too far away. You get things like starburst galaxies, like the near, uh, these bright near ones, M82 and NGC253, have been detected at these energies. Okay? And starburst galaxies are galaxies where you have regions with lots of supernova, so you expect many cosmic rays there, and they are indeed, the density looks like 500 times the density of super or cosmic rays in, the, in our galaxy. You get things like radio galaxies, where you have a, a big uh, lobe or a jet, where you inject cosmic rays into in, intergalactic medium. And you get things like clusters of galaxies, where you are simply looking at many galaxies uh, especially rich clusters, you have many, many galaxies in the center of the clusters. And you accumulate the uh, cosmic rays from all these galaxies and maybe from uh, things like large scale shocks in the clusters of galaxies. So I'm a bit running a bit short of time. I will skip this thing about radio galaxies. We are studying these kind of galaxies. This is a picture in optical, okay, not in, in our frequencies. but. What has been proven is actually that there's this kind of radio galaxy, galaxies with jets are injecting lots of uh, cosmic rays into intergalactic medium in these big uh, lobes. Okay, I will be skipping all this, I think. Let, let, let's move to the largest scales, uh, clusters of galaxies uh, that look uh, like this. I mean, huge concentrations of galaxies. They are the largest bound structures in our universe, and they are still forming now, actually. So you count just the, the, the amount of the potential, gravitational potential energy of all this gas that is uh, contracting, okay, which is a lot of gas, uh, a lot of material. You have huge budgets of energies, right? If only some fraction of this budget goes into cosmic rays, they should be detectable, okay, actually. The synchrotron emission has been detected in the center of galaxies, and synchrotron emission comes from cosmic ray electrons. Okay, so we know there are electrons in the center of this of these clusters, um, and we expect electrons to be accompanied by protons, because typically when you accelerate an electron, it's even easier to accelerate a proton. That's what happens in our galaxy. There are many more protons than electrons. And that's what we expect to happen also in, at the level of clusters. So we know there are electrons. Uh, we expect protons. And we would very much like to know how many protons, what is the density of these cosmic ray protons. Actually, these electrons may come from protons. Okay? They may be secondaries of the, of, of the interaction of protons with, with matter. Okay? So what we did with magic, uh, actually, is uh, this is very much a work of uh, Paco's group in Granada. We selected a cluster which was expected to be very bright, 
because it has a massive core and it, ha it shows a radio mini halo. I mean, it shows synchrotron emission. This cluster is Perseus, it's pretty nearby, only 78 megaparsecs. And we spent quite some time, I mean, 85 hours, which is actually like two years of observations for these kind of telescopes. Uh, we didn't detect anything, okay? So what do we do? We kill Paco because he was choosing the, <laughs> the wrong place or, well, actually the upper limits themselves are very interesting because the upper limits, which I show here as a function of energy, okay, this is around one TeV, one tera electron volt, okay? So they are already uh, in tension in tension with the, the results of simulations. I mean, you make cosmological hydrodynamical simulations, taking into account galaxies, not taking into account galaxies, you get this, these lines here, okay? And the upper limits are sometimes below the line, so there must be something wrong with this kind of uh, simulation. There's something that is not in there. You can actually calculate an absolute minimum gamma flux, assuming that all the electrons they have been detected in radio synchrotron, come from uh, protons, and then you would be here. So we are even a factor three away from the absolute minimum gamma ray flux that you expect. So we are somehow close to the detection. Okay, so with this, we can actually um, limit the ratio of the density of cosmic rays and the density of thermal uh, uh, of the thermal component in the cluster. So uh, all this material that produces X-rays. This is expressed actually in terms of pressure. We can uh, limit the pressure of cosmic rays respect to the pressure in gas, thermal gas in the cluster to be the, between 1% and 10%, okay? Which is very much an interesting result. It is something that you cannot get any other way, okay? And we can even set the, a lower limit to the magnetic field in the center of the cluster. Okay, which is uh, something like four to nine micro gauss. Okay. What's the radius of the cluster? The radius of the cluster. The radius of the cluster. Okay, I think it was in the around uh, up to hundred kiloparsecs. Or so, if I remember correctly, yes. Uh, no, no, first question. Uh, it, uh, when you say eighty-five hours means two, two years of observation. What, what is the? <laughs> It doesn't work, right? I mean, there are many more hours in a year. But, uh, well, we can only observe uh, when, uh, at night, uh, in, in actually dark nights, okay, because when the moon is just killing our, our detectors, okay. When you observe an astronomical source, it's not always there. The stars come and go, okay. And when you want to observe at uh, somehow low zenith angle, so close to the zenith, close to the top of the sky, it gives you very much many restrictions of when you can observe. On top of that, other people want to observe too, okay? So you have to share the time with other people. So at the end, every year, you can get something like 50 hours or maximum 100 hours in a crazy case with these kind of telescopes. In the summer, no? For well, for when to be up yes, when it's, it's, it's there, yes. So the total number of hours is about 1,000. Total number of hours available to uh, one of these telescopes every year is like 1,000, yeah. 1,000 to 1,500, something like that. You cannot get more than that. You have bad weather too and technical problems. <laughs> okay, so we know by experience that you cannot get more than 1,000 for all the sources, okay? And then you cannot observe all the sources every month of the year. Sometimes it's a summer source, sometimes it's a winter source. Okay, so these were the results that we got uh, from Perseus cluster in terms of density of the cosmic rays and, and also limiting the magnetic field, which is, is also an interesting result. So I wanna move to the second part of, of my talk, uh, AGNs as probes and of a stragalactic background and light uh, and it's a stragalactic magnetic field actually. So. AGNs, these active galactic nuclei, where, where you have in these guys, these galaxies, is, is a supermassive black hole here that is a critical matter, and where you generate, uh, well, the galaxy essentially shines only in the very center, of, very center of the galaxy is, is, is what is shining. Every, everything is power, 
most of the activity is powered by the black hole accreting like matter. And sometimes you have jets uh, visible in, in radio, for instance, or in optical. And we are normal, we are, we, at these energies, we are detecting AGNs with jets, typically. Okay. We believe that um, what happens is that uh, there are shocks in the jet. I mean, you may have regions of overdensity in the jet, okay, where you hit other regions and you develop shocks, okay, of density shocks. And these shocks, same as in supernova remnants, you can generate, uh, you can accelerate protons or electrons. And these protons of electrons that are accelerated produce gamma rays via pi zero or, or, or via inverse Compton, for instance. Okay, so, but uh, I will not be talking here about the physics of these <coughs> kind of guys. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, what we can do with these observations in terms of um, more fundamental astrophysics or physics. Okay. So you just have to remember that the AGN is producing these nice gamma rays that we can detect at the Earth. Okay. So you got your AGN here, and one of the things you can do is actually to measure the attenuation of the gamma rays, I mean, uh, to measure the density of extragalactic background light. Now how do you do that? You, you have the AGN here, and on the way to the Earth, it, it, it finds a, a, another photon, a low energy photon, with a, maybe a CMB photon, cosmic microwave background photon, or it may be an infrared optical uh, photon coming from a galaxy, okay? So the whole extragalactic medium is full of these guys. And when you interact, these two gammas interact, you can produce a pair, electron positron, and that means that the, your initial spectrum of gamma rays is distorted, okay? Because some, here you may have more absorption, here you may have less absorption. It depends on the shape of actually this spectrum of, of, of photons, okay? And well, one simple relation to keep in mind is that the, the gammas of this energy one tera electron volt typically interact with uh, photons of 1.24 micrometers, right? And this is infrared, right? So when you have one TV uh, gammas, it's infrared. When you go to low energies, it's optical. High energies is mid infrared, far infrared, okay? So uh, by looking at how this shape is distorted, is this shape changes, you can get a, you can measure the the density of this extragalactic background light. Just a couple of words about this extragalactic background light. It has a spectrum like this, or an energy distribution like this. It's a function of uh, frequency or wavelength. At optical frequencies, you have light produced by stars. All the stars of all the galaxies in the universe, for instance, can contribute to this EBL. And at, uh, this is, 10 micro, 10 microns, 10 micrometers. So in this infrared region, you have uh, light of stars that have been reprocessed by dust. So the light uh, can excite dust, and this dust re-emits in infrared, okay? It gets warm and it re-emits in infrared. So what you see is direct light from stars and reprocessed light by dust these two peaks. And then at, at uh, well, at radio waves, you have CMB. Okay, so this is uh, how the stragalactic background like light looks like at these energies. Okay. Actually, is is actually this is uh, as you can imagine is is all the stars in the universe, you one or at least those that are closer to us, and all the galaxies. Uh, so this is a valuable imprint of the history of the universe. There's a lot of, I mean, if you would like to calculate theoretically uh, what is the density of EBL, you ha would have to model things like star formation, galaxy evolution, to put that all together to try to, to calculate the, the density of the EBL. And it happens that direct measurements, I mean, you may wonder, why don't you just build a telescope and you point there and you measure the density of the light? So why do you care? Well, the direct measurements in the infrared are very challenging because there's something called zodiacal light that is simply sunlight, which is scattered in the plane of the solar system. 
and this is a terrible foreground. This is lots of light that interferes with your measurement. So it's very difficult to measure it directly. Okay? So that's why we use this trick to look at this EVL light, because it's very hard to measure it directly. So how to extract actually information more technically? Well, uh, what you have is uh, an AGN typically uh, has a, this is spectral energy distribution, this spectrum. I was telling you before, this is a typical shape of an AGN. You have a peak at X-rays and a peak somewhere uh, around 10 GeV, 100 GeV or so. So this is where your Fermi detector in a satellite uh, can follow the source, and this is where your Cherenkov telescopes are, okay? And this is where you expect attenuation, okay? So this is, if you know that the shape of the AGN is like this, because we have looked at many of these guys, then by looking at uh, in X-rays and up to these energies, you can extrapolate that the source spectrum will look like this in our energy range. And when you observe, you find that it's down here. And that means there must be some attenuation in the EBL, okay? So by measuring this uh, attenuation, you can, uh, is the way you calculate the density of the EBL, okay? This is a simplistic way to, to, to explain this. I mean, you can actually set as conditions that uh, this guy always falls down. I mean, you don't need to know precisely the shape. You can just assume that it is, is concave here or you can assume that it never exceeds this, uh, this spectral slope here, which is also the case. By using these conditions, technically you can extract the density of the EBL, okay? This is actually what we did with MAGIC back in 2008. We did it with this source, 3C279, which is a, a still the most distant very high energy source detected. It has this reshift, 0.5. And what we measured <laughs> was this spectrum here, the black dots, okay? And then you can start to deabsorb, so you can extract to, you can extract the intrinsic spectrum of the source by uh, trying different EBL densities, okay? And at some point it gets totally uh, unphysical because this spectrum cannot just go up. So you know that the EBL must be uh, must be around here. I mean, the density of the EBL must correspond to this deabsorption. Okay, so this is how you can actually constrain the density. I mean, you know that the EBL must be uh, less than this, less than this, so that it's not unphysical. Okay, so what you get is actually an upper limit. This was this green curve. This is density of the EBL. This is one micron. So this is optical and infrared and you can get these upper limits here, and there are also some lower limits coming from galaxy counts, and you know that the EBL must be in this range here, okay? All the curves are models of the EBL, okay? Theoretical models. So this was a very interesting result because it already restricted the, the range of possible EBL densities. Now people, our competitors actually are doing even better than that, because they were lucky enough to get an AGN that was incredibly bright, okay? So they got lots of photons, and they could actually measure the EVL. And that's also because the models we are getting are more and more realistic. So you can predict what is the, what is called optical depth, that is simply, uh, is like the distance divided by the mean path, mean absorption path. So, and that's the, if this is the intrinsic flux and this is the observed flux, this, the attenuation goes with e to the minus tau, right? Okay, this is what is so-called, uh, is called optical depth. And you can put here a free parameter and you can allow this free parameter to go up and down. So that's the way you check your model. If it's slightly more than your model, it's slightly less than your model, okay? You fit the actual spectra to this and you get that alpha is essentially one. So the model, I'm talking, for instance, about this model by Franceschini, 2008. It's pretty much right. So we know now that this was the actual measurement here. So this is no longer an upper limit. It's, it's, it's a band. It's a real measurement. Okay. Okay, so if you are there, 
we can actually say that now uh, the EBL has been measured essentially in all these uh, wavelengths up to energies maybe of uh, 100 micrometers, which is the far infrared. Okay, where there is still some uncertainty between the models and lots of points are contradictory. This is actually the, the pink band is actually a, a model by Alberto Dominguez, which was a PhD student of Paco. They were also very active in this. So, and actually you can see that the model of Dominguez, which is pretty much a fashionable model, is, is very much in contradiction by a factor two to, to this other model here. But this is the only region where the uncertainty is, is pretty big and there are discrepancies. So we are now targeting this area here, but we, we know that the density here is rather well under control. We are talking about errors of 20, 30 percent, okay? So uh, we can do, we can go further and do some kind of physics with this, with this kind of, with this knowledge. So it's now no longer about measuring the EBL. It's about, since you know the EBL density, Okay, and you have quite some control over the physics of AGNs. You can do other things. One of the things you can do is actually, as you can imagine, the attenuations of the photons depends on the length of the path that the photons travel. Okay, and we know the recipe of the source, but the length of the path may be longer or shorter depending on the Hubble constant. Okay, so you may think that the uh, the length is like this because you know the Hubble constant, but maybe longer, so you're making a mistake in the Hubble constant. The more mathematically, the optical depth has this uh, term here that depends on the Hubble constant. Also, these uh, here this, there are terms that depend on the on the Hubble constant. This was explored in the past by these people in at my institute. These are the French people. But recently, uh, Paco has actually been measuring quite some, have been, it, it has just submitted uh, quite an impressive result by using the latest measurements of the, of the EBL. And they claim that they can make actually competitive measurements of the Hubble constant. This is the Hubble constant with different methods, right? So here you have your type 1A supernova, for instance, with these error bars. And using this method, you can get this kind of error bars, okay? So you may argue that it's, a, it's not a much better uh, CMB and BAO is quite impressive. You can argue that it's not uh, statistically very uh, competitive, but the systematically I think it adds something. I mean, it's, it's a different method, independent method to measure the, the Hubble constant. You can do uh, another interesting thing. Uh, you can measure the magnetic fields. Well, you know, this is just a little introduction. We are measuring, we can measure magnetic fields in galaxies. We can measure magnetic fields in clusters of galaxies. We use conventional methods such as Faraday rotation, disper dispersion measurement, Zeeman, or synchrotron radiation. Remarkably, all the magnetic fields are around 0.1 to 10 micro gauss at very different scales. Uh, but these guys are probably the amplifi amplified magnetic fields. They, they came from seed magnetic fields, primordial magnetic fields, which were ampli amplified probably through this dynamo effect. Okay, so this seed field, this original field that was in the universe be be before the, all the uh, formation of galaxies, it has not been measured because it's, it's just too low. Okay, so all the methods, like these conventional methods, only provide upper limits to this extragalactic magnetic field. Okay, less than around this, these numbers. <coughs> and the, maybe these incredibly empty regions, the voids in the large structure where you may still have this seed uh, magnetic field and we would like to know what is this seed magnetic field in, this, in, in these voids, okay? So how to do it? Uh, well, well, just to tell you that the, between different simulations of, of the distribution of the magnetic field, there are quite some uh, uncertainties and for instance, you can look at the feeling factor of the universe with magnetic field. I mean, how much of the universe has a magnetic field of more than 10 to the minus 12 Gauss? Well, some models are predicting all of the universe. Some models are telling you that it's 5% of the universe, okay? So they are 
there's quite some uncertainty here. That means that there's quite some knowledge about the few measurements of all this. So we are interested in that. And this is another way to express it. I mean, this is the limits. This is magnetic field. Okay, and this is 10 to the minus 6 micro gauss. So typically, you are here with galaxies around here. And you can set limits using these methods. And what I show here is a tricky thing. It's the, it's, it's the magnetic field. You can expect that uh, magnetic field has a, always the same orientation for, say, one megaparsec or so. Okay, so there's some coherence. Uh, there's some domain with a coherent magnetic field. Okay. So this is this lambda b okay, in megaparsec. So this is one megaparsec. You assume that your magnetic field has a coherence length of one megaparsec. Okay, so depending on what coherence length you assume, I mean, what is the size of these domains of magnetic field, uh, you get different limits for the magnetic field. Okay, so this is what this plot, this plot tries to express. And there are upper limits, but there are no actual lower limits. You may get lower limits from theoretical considerations, but there are no real measurements. Okay. So, uh, you expect maybe seed files to, to fit seed fields to be around here at maybe 10 to the minus 18 micro, micro gauss. So one way you can do this is, is now you go farther. You, you remember what I told you, gamma uh, interact with the gamma of the EBL to produce an electron. Okay. But this, this, this energy is not lost okay, because you have your energy, your electron, and the electron Eventually, it, it interacts with the CMB again. Okay? And through inverse Compton scattering, you produce another gamma. Okay? So you have primary gammas coming from the AGN and secondary gammas. Okay? A cas uh, it's like a cascade. But the, in first approximation, you have a spectrum of gamma, primary gammas and a spectrum of secondary gammas okay? at low energies. Okay? Uh, but the electron. The gamma goes through intergalactic magnetic field with no problems. But uh, on the way from the AGN to the Milky Way, the electron deflects on the intergalactic magnetic field. Okay? So the secondary gammas will not have the same direction of the primary gammas. Okay? If you are here and you reconstruct the direction of the source by looking at the secondary gamma, you think that your source is here. Okay? Essentially, what you see is your source primary gammas, and then a halo of secondary gammas around your source. Okay? So and this, the size of this halo depends on the intergalactic magnetic field and of the energy. So the just some scales, I mean, this time it takes, this is 100 megaparsecs. I mean, we are talking about these voids, for instance, of the large structure, large scale structure of the universe. Um, and typically, the, the mean free path of, of for per per production is 30 megaparsecs or so, for energies around 1 TV. And then this happens very quick. This may be like 1 kiloparsec. And then again, you have a gamma. Okay. So as I said, secondary gammas, they develop a halo around the source. You can look, try to see these halos, extended emission around your source with Jenkov telescopes. But they also follow a longer path. I mean, these guys. If a direct gamma, a primary gamma, goes like this, these guys will go like this and like this. So it takes longer. And that means that the secondary emission is delayed with respect to the first one. So you have a time delay. And sometimes they call it time echo. Okay. So you have an AGN that, that suddenly goes up very fast, one minute, and then it goes down. You may see that primary emission, a flare of one minute. And then you have a secondary emission delayed by one minute or something like that. Um, as I said, the, the secondary gammas have, they have lower energies. Okay, so the, this second component is at lower energy. So you can also search in the spectra for these secondary components. So all these three methods can be used to, to extract information about the magnetic field. And that's what actually was did with Fermi, not at our energies, but with Fermi and Hess, this competitor experiment. Okay, so what they did was first, you look at this. What they detected at very high energies was this spectrum. Okay? And you can deabsorb the spectrum. This is the original spectrum. You know the EBL. Okay? You deabsorb, 
and this is the primary spectrum. Then you calculate what is the uh, spectrum of that you get after the EBL, and it looks something like it must go through the through the hash points, and it goes. It looks like this. Okay, this is the calculated second component with no magnetic field. Okay, and then you measure with with Fermi, and you don't see anything, and you set an upper limit. You don't see this component. That means that there must be some magnetic field. Okay, so you can set a limit on the magnetic field. You know that the magnetic field cannot be zero. It has to be more than 10 to the minus whatever. Okay, that's what they actually did. This was published in Science uh, two years ago, three years ago, and they could actually set limits down here. Okay, uh, depending on the coherence length from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 17. Okay. With magic, what we did was to look at some of these AGNs and to look for this hollow. And if we look at the, we had the AGN that is a point source. We look for this hollow, okay, around the source. And, and we didn't see any hollow. So you can again see set upper limits that are in this region here. Okay, so we are very much limiting this, this area here. It's a lower limit, but it, it must be, uh, uh, so magnetic field must be up here, okay. But don't take it so seriously because there are a couple of, <laughs> you have to read the paper, I mean, there are a couple of sis very serious systematic uh, caveats here. Okay. Is there a way to constrain the coherence length? Uh, I mean, on well, I don't know of any. I mean, not in these voids. So it looks incredibly difficult. So uh, at the end, you're left with these kind of plots. It's, I think it's difficult. So just uh, to finish, because that's the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, a bit looking into the future. I mean, the future, this kind of astronomy, both for magic and for all the other telescopes, we have all joined together now, uh, all the collaborations working in this topic and we are planning to build this experiment called CTA, Cherenkov Telescope Array, okay? So this will be very much like uh, a larger version of MAGIC. These telescopes are actually bigger than MAGIC. There will be four of them. There will be many of these mid-sized telescopes, okay? And even more of these small telescopes and uh, the idea with larger telescopes is you go down in threshold, in energy threshold, you go down to energies close to those detected by Fermi from space. Here you have many more telescopes, you, you have more collection area. It's like a brute force approach to more collection area. Instead of thinking in a more clever way, you build many telescopes, okay? And here you need even more collection area with small telescopes to go to multi-TV energies, to even energies up to 10 to the 14 electron volts or so to explore these supernova remnants up to the highest possible energies to try to really settle that supernova remnants accelerate cosmic rays up to the knee to 10 to the 15 electron volts or so. Okay. So, yeah, I, that was the end. Yes? Located where? That I was coming to that. I mean, <laughs> there will be plan is to have two of these observatories one in the northern hemisphere, another one in the southern hemisphere. So for the northern hemisphere, uh, Tenerife is one of the options. So there are three candidate sites for the north. One is in Tenerife, another one is in Mexico, and there are two in the US, okay? And Tenerife is, very is, is a very good place, okay? We know from MAGIC uh, that it's a very good place for this kind of astronomy. In the south, the possibilities are Namibia, Argentina, and Chile. Okay, so this will be resolved this year. So this year we'll probably know if it comes to Spain. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, any questions uh, for Juan? Uh, so, um, well, you mentioned uh, a little bit now at the, uh, at the end with this CTA, but uh, in these observations on the uh, gamma rays from supernova remnants, mm -hmm. so you just have Yes, I don't know if I have some. And e? uh, and yeah, I have a spectrum here. Yep. Uh, uh, here. 
So these are the magic points are, well, hard to see them in this crosses. Okay. Ten, yeah? 10 to the 12. Up to here, almost. 10 to the 12, yeah, 1 TeV. Okay, so this is the photon, the photon, the gamma ray spectrum. So how do you know which cosmic rays, or, or that they are cosmic rays and, not, and they are not uh, um, electrons? Well, you say the argument of 60 MeVs, but uh, we have other uh, supernova remnants where they are consisting with electromagnetic um, production. And second is how do you know whether they are protons or other type of cosmic rays? Okay. So first one is from the spectrum. These are models. I mean, you look at this solid line. This is pi zero decay. So that means protons going into gammas. Okay. So these are hadrons. This is cosmic ray protons. And this is the the this uh, dashed line are Brenstrahlung. It's Brenstrahlung for electrons. Okay. So as you see here, they are essentially compatible. Well, there's a big error here in the measurements. They are essentially compatible. So from the spectrum down here, I don't think it's compatible with the brain stratum, but up here is compatible. Okay. So from the spectrum, I don't think magic can say very much. But from the morphology, I mean, the supernova renan emits in all this region in, in radio and x-rays. While it's only bright in this small region, a small part of the supernova remnant in gamma rays. And this region is, uh, is where the molecular cloud is. That's where you have target for, for hadronic uh, production. It's not, for instance, uh, you make the numbers, you cannot get that with brain stratum of electrons. For this particular region, I mean, you would expect emission from the whole place. I inverse Compton is totally excluded because this depends on light, and light is all over the place. Okay. Yeah, one of the main points that you emphasized was the origin of cosmic rays. What is the connection? What is the what is the concerning the origin of cosmic rays? What is the connection between uh, gam uh, gamma ray telescopes and Oyer, for example? Because okay. Oyer is also so. studying that. No? Well, to begin with, Oyer. Uh, observes cosmic rays at very, very high energies, 10 to the 18 electron volts or so. Yeah, I mean, here in the spectrum, we are studying, we are studying gam gamma rays up to 10 to the 12. They are, uh, we, we will try with CTA to go up to 10 to the 14 or so. So up to 10 to the 15 electron volts, cosmic rays, okay? So these are galactic cosmic rays, as up to the knee, what is called the knee. And there's a change of slope, and at some point, it, 10 to the 17 or so, you start to probably cosmic rays all become extragalactic, okay? And this is the kind of cosmic rays that OJ is studying, okay? Any more questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering about that characterization of the extragalactic background light. So this is the integration, what you're looking at is the integrated path of these mm -hmm. gamma rays from the source all the way to our position. Mm -hmm. So that depends a lot on the, the spectrum of the source. So how mm -hmm. well is that known? And how would that affect the reconstruction of the EBL? Okay, well that's what I very schematically try to explain here. Yeah. So agents, uh, Actually, they are not so different from this very schematic uh, shape. They are very much like a power law here and another power law here, power law and power law. So you can describe actually the spectrum with very few parameters. What is the peak energy here, the peak energy here, the power law spectral index, okay? So if you fit this bump here and you fit part of this bump here, you have pretty much control over the, the, the shape of the spectrum. And what uh, the... Yes, yes. Anyway, we are not, quite often we don't even use the whole information. We just ask for the spectrum to go down here, okay? So you can measure the spectrum here. You just require that the spectrum is concave, so that the, the slope uh, gets larger and larger here, okay? Mm -hmm. And only with that you can set a, an upper limit on the EBL. And uh, the shape of this EBL must vary a lot from from source to source, or uh, this, this is a redshift dependent thing. Right? It depends on the redshift. Yeah. Yes. 
So you have to take that into account. And has, has that variation been characterized? It's not negligible. Uh, the way you do that is, uh, well, uh, uh, to normally re uh, you normally rely on models. Yeah. And these models may have more or less, I mean, <laughs> they may be more or less theoretic, theoretical. I mean, sometimes you can actually use some measurements uh, like I mean, Paco can give you uh, 10 or 20 seminars about this. <laughs> uh, you can model the, or you can measure the spectra of galaxies at different redshifts. Okay, so all that information goes into the model, for instance, the spectral shapes of the galaxies. You have to put all of them together, okay, to get a handle of your model. Okay, and it's a redshift uh, dependent uh, uh, shape of the EBL. So this would be from many objects or from? one in particular? Uh, this kind of model, These, yeah. well, this kind of model is actually at, at receive zero, yeah. so now, okay, or here, I mean, right. okay. And depending on the receive, it, it changes, okay. But the way you normally compare is receive zero, okay. But it is, as you said, it's more complicated. I mean, the, as you go farther and farther away, you have to rely more and more on models, and you definitely have to use this Progressive evolution. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, any more questions? We have a comment related to CTA. What was the funding situation? Uh, uh, regarding to CTA, what's the funding situation? I mean, you are expecting the experiment to start running um, 220 or 218 or 2018. And okay, well. Uh, <laughs> You can have more or less informed, more or less optimistic uh, well, <laughs> points of view. <laughs> What's the planning? What's the planning? 2000, uh, realistic, we'll be doing some physics in 2019. You can, be, you can believe me, uh, you can believe me or not. Uh, and the total cost of the project for one observatory? Total cost back in 2008 was estimated as 150 ma uh, million euros. 150. 50 for the north and 100 for the south. Okay, now we are going up by with inflation, <laughs> actually. So now it's more like 170. But you don't take into account the operation costs. It's just no. the construction. 10% yeah. per year. Per year. Uh, that's a major issue. Yeah, yeah, that's why people <laughs> forget about it. No, people don't forget. <laughs> Maybe they, they forget to tell the funding agency, but yeah, they don't they forget. Don't <laughs> Okay, so if there are no any more questions, let's start uh, one again. Thank you.